Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar on what's a BDCMM. I'm Mallory Price and will monitor today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website by tomorrow for future playback. Thank you for the questions you submitted at registration. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions tab on your control panel and we will answer as many as we can. An exceptional line of individuals are joining me today, including Paul Deaton, Executive Director of the Business Winning Institute at Shipley. Paul joins us from the UK today. He has led dozens of organizational change initiatives with companies wanting to improve business winning performance. Paul co-developed and co-authored the Business Development Capability Maturity Model, or BDCMM, as a standard for organizational excellence. We're happy to have Paul with us. We're also to ha happy to have Vicki Grasinger, Executive Consultant at Shipley. Vicki is an executive director with expertise in business winning best practices and business process improvement. Vicki has worked for several large multinational organizations in a variety of industries and has led many initiatives to improve organizational performance. Brad Douglas, Executive Vice President of Global Strategy at Shipley is also joining us. Brad oversees all training and certification for Shipley and works with our global offices in 14 countries. He has helped many organizations improve their business winning performance. Again, thank you all for joining us today and please enjoy the webinar. Brad, I will turn the discussion over to you. Okay, um, thank you, Mallory, and thanks to everyone for setting aside some time to join us uh, today. This topic may be unfamiliar to uh, many of you who join uh, Shipley webinars regularly. And um, so again, thanks for setting aside some time to learn about this. We hope it'll be meaningful. It'll be something that you'll think about and consider um, if you're looking for ways to improve performance uh, within your organization. And a special thanks to Paul and Vicki um, and Mallory for their help uh, putting this together, planning it, and organizing it. So let's talk through, um, just quickly, this is what we're going to cover. Uh, what is a, what is BDCMA? You know, what, what is it? Uh, what's the impact of, uh, you, you know that there's the word maturity in that CMM, capability maturity model. So what is the impact of a mature organization? What are the different levels, the process areas, goals, practices, is BDCMM sustainable within organizations? We wanna talk about that briefly. And then if we have time or as we go, uh, we'll address some questions and, and talk about questions that some of you have. And you can submit questions in your uh, navigation panel as we go. And so we welcome that and in, invite that as well. So that's what we're gonna cover. Um, so let's jump right into BDCM, you know, what is it? It's probably new to many of you. Business Development Capability Maturity Model. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, CMM models in other areas, and Paul's going to address that a little bit more when he talks about the history of, of the model. But BD, Business Development Capability Maturity Model, it's the centerpiece of Shipley's practice area uh, within, what is known as the Business Winning Institute here at Shipley. It appraises and, and assesses organizational maturity within business development or business winning. Identifies strengths and gaps in five key capability areas and categories. And so uh, Paul's going to describe those as well a little later for us. What are the core five areas that organizationally we need to focus on if we're going to try to improve business winning performance. Uh, the BDCMM and the Business Winning Institute, our objective is to try to recommend and help you implement business winning strategies and tactics to you know, go from maybe a, a level one to a level two or a two to a three. And then ultimately, the BDCMM help organizations gain a competitive advantage and help them ultimately compete and win more business. So in a nutshell, that's what BDCMM is. It's a practice, it's, it's part of a practice area within Shipley's global organization 
that does just that. It does appraisal, assessment, findings, and recommendations for organizational improvement. So Paul, if you just walk everyone through, since most probably are not aware, just a, a brief history and overview of what BDCMM is. Certainly, Brad. Um, so capability maturity models or CMMs actually go way back. The original CMM was created for software development in the mid eighties, but since then they have been further developed and broadened to cover product development and service delivery with application in almost all sectors. So well beyond the initial DOD focus. Most recently, the Cybersecurity and Maturity Model, or CMMC, was developed to address today's online security threats. All CMMs perform essentially the same purpose, that is, to take a complex activity and package best practices up logically and simply to allow improvements to be planned and tracked. And business winning is one such complex activity. So Shipley developed the BD CMM uh, in 2004 to help organizations build business winning capability and deliver sustainable ongoing performance. The current BDCMM is available as an ebook and was last updated in 2021, Brad. Thank you, Paul. Um, Paul, let me just piggyback on what you said for just briefly. Um, so do, does the business development capability maturity model, does that align and mirror with the other CMMs? Is that what I heard? Yeah, so we've taken the same basic structure, Brad, to simplify something very complicated and make it simple. Um, but obviously the content changes by discipline. Okay. Um, so we're aligned with the CMM and also by uh, reference to CMMI. So we are completely aligned with those existing industry models, Brad. Great, okay, thank you. All right, now you see uh, a common question that I'm guessing many, many of you today in the webinar have. Why are business leaders typically even interested in a model that helps them transform their business winning process? So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. There's, we found, Paul, as Paul said, we've been doing this since 2000 uh, for a while, <laughs> several years. And um, there are a couple of drivers that are very common when we work with organizations that when they want to actually drive improved performance. One area is they're facing newer or stronger competition in their market, or maybe they've had leadership changes or succession in leadership. And so there's a new vision and objectives to improve business winning. Uh, we see pre and post merger or acquisition uh, as a driver for organizations wanting to be more uh, up to date and current in the way they approach business winning. And then the, this concept of we're constantly fighting and, and you know reinventing the wheel on every key pursuit and every major pursuit and we're putting out fires and that becomes a driver. How do we get away from that behavior and improve efficiency and effectiveness in business winning. So again, I'm gonna to turn to Paul to talk about those four drivers as to why an organization would even consider moving forward on trying to improve or transform their business winning capability. Uh, Paul, would you go through uh, those four areas for us? Certainly, Brad. So um, we'll start with the set of clients who come to use a BD CMM because somehow the game has changed. So what was working in the past isn't necessarily gonna work in the future. Maybe it's been easy for a while, fairly uncompetitive and complacency may have set in. Uh, perhaps there's a new player on the pitch and maybe the new player is taking market share. So these, these um, uh, circumstances can also combine with the rules of the game maybe have changed. Maybe the procurement approach has changed from their client base. And all these things come together to motivate a competitor. So something changed, something has driven a competitor to become more aggressive, Brad. Okay, good. Newer or stronger competition, like you said, the game's changed. Um, and uh, the other driver, the leadership, yeah, sure. We see this one quite a bit, actually. Um, 
driven by a change in leadership. A trigger is a, a change in leadership at senior level. So someone with a desire to understand current business winning capability as a basis for change and improvement. And for that understanding, importantly, to come from an independent source. So to go to another organization to find out actually what is a reality within their business. Shareholders or key internal stakeholders may also have created leadership pressure for action. Uh, maybe things are sort of going okay, um, but new leadership may want to take a proactive step to avoid complacency. And inevitably, leaders, new and old, um, also are being asked to win more with less and need to find a smart way to achieve this. And here, actually, I'd like to bring in Vicky um, on this particular trigger. Um, your thoughts and experiences on this one, please, Vicky. Oh, very definitely. The leadership changes occur through various cycles, and we do see a, a lot of change and interest in understanding the organizations with, with new executive sponsors. Thanks, Vicky. Okay, yeah, those, can those new those new sponsors um, come with new priorities, and usually with a a, a pretty strong push to uh, to make things happen. So, thank you. Yeah, the the third driver that we mentioned earlier was this idea of all of the the uh, acquisitions, mergers, even internal uh, changes that are going on. Would you uh, again, Paul, address this for us as a driver? Sure. Well, this certainly is the third trigger, um, pre or post M&A, um, which includes an internal uh, merger. So our experience here is that if you bring together higher and lower maturity organizations, they combine maturity, unfortunately tends to track towards lower rather than higher maturity, which more unfortunately tends to coincide with high expectations of instant high performance for the new combined entity. So the BDCMM is used ideally as part of the pre-M&A due diligence process, but it can also be used during post-M&A integration, helping to bring together the best of each organization so they can perform uh, effectively fairly quickly. And, and again, if I can bring you in, Vicky, on your experience around M&A, perhaps with a, uh, perhaps an internal perspective. Yeah, in my experience with mergers and integration, it's best to assess the organizations prior to a merger, but more often it's post-merger. And I've seen companies in aerospace and technology industries come together with differences in culture, talent, process, and tools, all the while expecting instant wins, as Paul said. And it doesn't happen that easily because as we all know, business winning is a team sport. So we first need to take the time to assess people, roles and responsibilities and processes before expecting major wins. Thanks, Vicki. Awesome, good. And then the, the fourth trigger or driver that we've talked about as to reasons why organizations would consider a BDCMM uh, intervention would be um, <laughs> this idea of, you know, we're, we're just losing, we're just losing too much too often or uh, we're having to to reinvent the wheel on every single bid. So again, Paul, if you'd walk us through some things you're seeing here. Sure. Well, as you say, Brett, sometimes an organization that's had a run of losses just needs to take a step back and try to understand why. If you've lost three or four or five on the bounce, that's not bad luck. There's something systemic happening. Of the four scenarios I've outlined here, this is perhaps the most difficult one to address because sometimes panic has already set in and there can be lots of sort of concern which gets in the way of clear thinking. But using the model, we can calmly find the underlying causes and create a go forward, if you like, fire prevention plan uh, that can help the organization to, to, to restabilize. And again, Vicky, you must have been in this situation with clients occasionally. Absolutely. And some organizations have, have that pattern of several losses, perhaps in a product line with a particular customer, or maybe across the board. And I've seen some organizations with inadequate long-term planning and investment. So they don't prioritize up front which product lines or opportunities they should be focusing on. And all are wake-up calls. 
Um, assessing an organization's as-is or present state is critical to, to determining root causes and gaps, which lead to identifying and imp implementing those performance improvements. Absolutely agree with this, Paul. Thanks, Vicki. So, so Paul, is this as simple as sometimes, you know, the, the management um, adage that, you know, we just don't, uh, well, I'll, I'll quote Stephen R. Covey, you know, one of his habits is sharpen the saw. You know, we're just so busy trying to compete and win and establish ourselves that we just don't push the pause button long enough to really take a look at how we can get better and more efficient. Is it is it that simple? We're just in a hurry and, and in a state of chaos? Yeah, I think you, you describe it well, Brad. And I think, um, you know, there is a certain amount of panic as well. Um, Mm. And, and sometimes a knee-jerk reaction can be actually completely the wrong strategy. So losing three or four on the bounce, or we need to bid more. Um, you know, let's get away from our comfort zone. Let's bid on products and services we don't typically, you know, deliver or have much expertise in, but we think we can get away with it. Or you know, so sometimes the knee-jerk reaction can be completely incorrect. And sometimes when we see these situations, we just sit down and look at the data and say, well, actually, as Vicky mentioned, you know, which areas are you more likely to win? Is it a question of focus rather than spreading and, and trying to win everything and losing seven, eight, nine, ten in a row? Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, what's the possible impact of applying this model, this capability maturity model, within a business development organization. Now, this is very high level summary, but what can we expect? We can expect improved win rates, capture rates um, on the average contract value. We can expect a reduction in overall costs because of efficiency gains. Uh, so those are what we would expect in working through with an organization, uh, this business development improvement. But not only those those expected, but other areas where we see performance improvement, uh, and both Paul and Vicky have alluded to this already. One is the reduced performance risk, because we now are consistent in our approach. It's repeatable. Uh, we know how to make it work, so we we are reducing our risk. Improved handover for better program and project delivery. This is a problem, as some of you know. We win the work. But the handover to actually execute on that contract becomes a problem. Why? Because we haven't gone through the upfront preparation. Uh, we're, not, we're not ready. Increased customer satisfaction and repeat work. Attract and retain the best business development uh, talent. And Vicki, I'm going to ask you to comment on this one uh, as well. But this, let me just say, this is becoming a big deal. Uh, most of us on this webinar are are likely involved in business development in some way. I, you know, I know many of you because you've joined webinars in the past and and you've worked with Shipley before. Um, but this idea of being able to attract the best talent and retain the best talent is becoming more and more critical in business development, business winning. Because if I'm looking for my next step as in my profession in proposals or capture management or sales or account account leadership i i'm looking to go to work for an organization that is well oiled and well established and running well this is going to attract if if we have our systems in place our structure in place our processes well defined we're efficient and effective for whether it's remote work or, or co-located work, we are more apt to attract the best talent. Uh, it's difficult to accept a job, a position with a company that is always operating in that level one ad hoc mode because it creates burnout. And so, uh, Vicki, uh, have does this resonate with your your professional experience, this idea of attracting and retaining the best talent? Um, it absolutely does, Brad, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a okay. later slide. But 
um, top talent want to go to the top organizations and those that have the discipline, the process, and the maturity are the companies to which they gravitate. So you've summarized it really well. Okay. All right, and then uh, Paul, you're aware because you you worked with this client intimately. Um, you're aware of a, a kind of a success story. Do you want to share what um, uh, what this company experienced as a result of implementing a business development capability maturity model assessment and appraisal? Sure. Um, so actually ahead of the webinar, Brad, we had a question about real world application examples. Mm. Um, so here's a relatively recent one. Um, our client was the signaling systems and infrastructure business within Alstom, the European rail transportation giants. We had two triggers actually coming together here. We had a change of leadership and we had a loss of market share. So two forces coming together. We delivered a, an appraisal to find the issues and worked with the Alstom team to implement a go forward plan. Uh, and these were their metrics. Uh, they increased their order intake, intake by 260%. And in terms of BD ROI, they increased that by 420%. And for me, the most pleasing part of this was they created 120 new high value jobs on the back of winning uh, a huge pipeline. Um, in fact, um, we have a, an interview with um, the BD and tendering director, which perhaps Brad, we can mail out with the webinar after the webinar. Uh, okay. So that people can hear firsthand from this particular client's experiences. Good. All right. So yeah, an example of a specific organization that took this to heart and applied it. Thank, thanks for sharing that, Paul. Um, Another question we've received, uh, I want to address, and, and actually I'm going to ask Vicki to uh, address this first and then see if we have other comments, but uh, why do organizations resist evaluating and assessing their business winning capability and process? You know, why do, why do we put up that wall and, and resist trying to improve? And, and this, this, I think, go ahead, Vicki, let's have you address these these areas of, of why we're so resistant to some of this. Yeah, I think it, the, the disparate stakeholder groups within an organization, uh, there there's an aversion to process. There are the aspects of reward management systems and compensation, also personality and behaviors. Short termism, we'll talk a bit about that, and then sales turnover. These are the barriers we see, but let's let's highlight a few. Winning big deals requires a common process or model with roles and responsibilities that are clearly defined. And in large organizations, we've all seen so many disparate stakeholder groups. It could be executive verticals, sales, organizations, product marketing, business development, capture, proposal development, business winning, a whole wide range of groups and it's challenging to get all those groups on the same page. When it comes to process uh, in the business development life cycle we've seen more aversion to process the farther left they begin in the cycle and farther to the right staff tend to be more process oriented as you get into capture proposal development contracts and delivery there's more process but and in, in the left side of the range, uh, there is less process and we need, we need to mindfully uh, take care of that. Rewards, uh, really critical. I've seen this many, time, many times in uh, client engagements or in corporations, uh, misaligned rewards and compensation. So account teams may be compensated for short-term wins only, say within a one-year cycle. And, and also sometimes the metrics are different. Uh, maybe they're compensated on the number of proposals submitted versus the number they've won. So you really do have to take all of those uh, things into consideration. And, and I've seen account executives only work on those aspects for which they are compensated. And, and yet there are many other elements to business winning. So those, those, that particular puzzle piece it, to me is, is key. And, and of course, sales turnover. 
Annual turnover in corporations is common. It creates a great deal of internal churn at the start of every new fiscal year. So business winning, however, is a long-term investment. And so we want the top talent to stay, to be, be there for the long term, and to help us transform uh, the corporate process. So those are just a few. Uh, we'll begin talking more about these, but uh, these are really the key ones. Excellent. Good. Uh, and I'm guessing most of us uh, on the webinar have experienced uh, some of this pushback. You know, we, we want to get better. We really want to improve, but um, but there, there's just something holding us back. Thank you, uh, Vicky, for that. And then I just uh, we wanted to just we've we've held, and I know several of you attend Shipley uh, webinars at various times, and you've heard us talk over many years about this concept of probability of win. If if we're trying to manage our pipeline, if we're trying to uh, pursue the, the best work with the best opportunity to win, we should be constantly tracking and monitoring our probability of win. And the reason we wanted to just bring this back into this webinar topic is this concept is at the heart of the BDCMM, the Business Development Capability Maturity Model, because it gives us a way to track and, and be better at monitoring our probability of win, which consists of these basic four levels, knowing our customer, assessing our competitors, defining capabilities, and taking a look at cost and price to win and value proposition. So um, wanted to make sure that everyone understood there's linkage between the legacy uh, business development best practices, if you will, probability of win, um, capture discipline, all of that to BDCMM. This is not some standalone uh, iconic model out there that doesn't integrate and intimately uh, engage with, with traditional business development best practice. Okay, with that, let's go on to another question that, that we receive. Uh, commonly, uh, what are the industry standards for an effective business winning process? Now, this goes really broader than BDCMM, and many of you are going to recognize this. Um, it's Shipley's seven-phase business development process, and, and so BDCMM aligns perfectly with this approach to business development winning. And, and so in answer to that question that came to us, you know, what are the industry standards? Well, you know, we've got to establish that benchmark of milestones, key tasks um, in, a, in a business development uh, process and approach. So what is this model? This is kind of what the theme of the webinar was, you know, what is a BDCMM? <laughs> and so let, uh, let us walk you through this model. I'm gonna ask Paul to do this. And uh, again, it's it's not complex. It, it's it's straightforward. It makes complete sense and aligns with what all of us are trying to accomplish, which is to compete better and win more work. So, Paul, would you walk us through how this model is structured? Sure. Uh, let's do that now, Brad. So, um, we've talked about the complexity involved in business winning, and how if we're trying to make a change, there's so many barriers. Um, so a lot of the value of the model is to take that complexity and make it really, really simple. So what we've done, we've taken all of this and put it into a simple five by five grid. There are five capability categories. These are customer, leadership, people, process management, and support. And each category then has a theme or a focus. Um, we then have five maturity levels going from level one, which is the lowest, uh, through to level five, the highest. Uh, level one is a chaotic level, and level five is the, um, uh, the optimizing level. The model then contains 16, think of them as sort of buckets of best practice uh, or clusters, and we call them process areas, each of which is aligned with one category 
and one maturity level. So exam for example, relationship management is a level four process area within the customer category. So all that complexity, Brad, put into a simple five by five grid that can be used to assess where an organization is at and develop a go forward plan. Okay. All right. So when a company engages in an appraisal or an assessment of some sort, this is this is the framework, this is the the model against which we're being assessed, right? We're evaluating each one of these category areas and, and trying to determine where we're at as far as a level of maturity. Did I get that right? Exactly so, Brad. So you're not uh, bringing together an, an individual's opinion. You're bringing together nearly 20 years of, of experience, best practice that's been captured in the model that can then be replayed back for the benefit of a client, Brad. Okay. So this, uh, this slide then demonstrates the, the objective, right, to progression? Sure. So as we grow in maturity, we move from an ad hoc, uh, chaotic, hero-driven level through to increasingly sophisticated and effective practices from level two, three, four, then five. Uh, level three is considered to be the beginning of high maturity and is a goal state for many of our clients. And what we'll do, Brad, we'll, we'll circle back over level three a little bit later in the webinar. Okay. Okay, good. So again, this this basically shows us, right, Paul, the the what we're trying to accomplish. We're, we're trying to elevate our game in each one of these areas where we might be lacking. Exactly so. So we help our clients through an appraisal to achieve sustainable maturity growth in areas which will impact them the most. So we spend a lot of time in the beginning understanding the client's vision, where they're heading, and then we, we, we work these levers to decide and work out together actually where we need to make recommendations to maximize the impact of their resources to go away and achieve that growth. Um, in fact, just while this slides up, Brad, we had a question on building capability in a virtual environment, hmm. assuming we're all, we're all very familiar with these days. Um, in fact, the 2021 version of the model addresses um, building virtual business winning environments, principally through the support category so the systems and infrastructure category, but there's also an element of people and how people can work virtually. Um, but the virtual aspect is certainly included and, uh, and the model is, is bang up to date there, Brad. Great question. And uh, thank you for, for asking that of us. That, that yeah, yeah, because most of us are, we're either in a virtual or, or kind of a mixed working environment. And so kind of bringing us back to why, you, you know, why business development capability maturity? Why, why does it matter? Here we show some actual examples of, of the potential, uh, right, Paul, that you've seen over the various projects you've worked on? Yeah, exactly. And verified by um, research studies uh, most recently in 2019. Um, so again, very up-to-date data. So maturity growth seems like a good idea, um, but we can actually correlate it uh, beyond that to business winning performance. So whether we look at the win rate, that is, you know, simple percentage of bids won versus bids submitted, or perhaps a more meaningful capture ratio, which is the dollar value of, uh, of bids won versus uh, the value that was bid. Um, I'd like to highlight that level three, and I talked about level three being a goal state for many clients. Typically level three organizations in between 66 and 80% of the dollar value that they bid for. Um, so for those on the webinar, if you know the figures for your organization, if you have them to hand or can relatively quickly research them, perhaps you might want to relate this table to your own organization. And in fact, we did have an audience question, uh, Brad, on the metrics criteria for evaluating an organization's maturity level. And I hope this slide provides at least a summary of the sorts of performance figures we're looking at 
typically at each of the maturity levels. Excellent. Great, great data, good information. All right. Um, this is this is a big question, and uh, go ahead. It was asked sustainability, because we all know that a lot of change initiatives and transformation efforts, um, whether they're simple or complex, uh, they don't pan out. You, you know, and so the question of can can this be sustained is a great one. And Vicky, I'd like you to bring in your uh, expertise and, and talk a little bit about this, what you've seen and and the sustainability of a, uh, this model. Oh, thank you. And absolutely, we've organizations have gone to all this effort to improve their organizations, put process and discipline in place. And sustainability means keep doing the right things. Don't let the organization slip back to the old ways. So we ensure that the model's in place and set. Then, for example, if a staff member moves on to a new role, the process exists and the next staff member can then plug into it. So that model doesn't um, go away. It, it's, it's strong, it's sustainable. And though the sustainability objectives are what we want to achieve, and let's institutionalize those practices that produce the desired outcomes, and the sustainability factors are how we achieve it. And it, you can think more about sustainability by thinking about policy, establishing roles and responsibilities, ensuring that resources are available, and then check and double check and engage your stakeholders to ensure that everything is moving and, and continues to do so. Brad? That question about, can you give us an example of what exactly is assessed as part of a BDCM appraisal? Paul, I'm going to turn to you and have you walk us through just one example within this, this model uh, as to what we would take a look at as part of a BDCM um, appraisal. And we'll start with this uh, customer uh, category and that level two response generation. So would you start us through this example, Paul? Yeah, of course, Brad, and this is a good example. We can all relate to response generation. That is, we've received a customer request, be it an ITT, an RFP, whatever form it may take, and we've got to provide back a customer focus and hopefully competitively discriminated um, response. So as you've highlighted, Brad, this is a level two process area in the customer category, one that every organization needs to be able to do, essentially. So let's dig a little deeper on this one, Brad, on the next slide. Um, what are we looking for was your question. Um, so we look for um, the client is reviewing and stripping customer requirements, um, building a good proposal strategy, following the customer's instructions, um, it's amazing how many do not, um, and gets everybody on the same page before starting to write the proposal. We're also looking for them to have um, established a, an operating point between solution and price, uh, and to keep the competition in mind. So, you know, not by themselves massively difficult tasks, but we're looking for them to be um, regularly implemented and to be sustainable, to Vicky's point earlier. Um, and again, Vicky, if I can turn to you, um, uh, in your experience, are there one or two of these that always seem to cause trouble, cause problems for organizations? Yeah, this is a great slide. All of these are key points in my book, but in my experience, the most problematic areas are inadequate win strategies, the lack of a compliance matrix, and lack of awareness of competitor environment solutions and pricing. I think those three are top, but the others are relevant as well. And in terms of win strategies, the organization needs to tell their story, obtain many inputs, but still write in one voice. That is, that is so key. And the compliance matrix is an effective way to help the evaluator score the proposal help them help you. And competitor information 
Having that awareness helps to assure that your proposal may be con competitively considered. You know, did your competitor build a prototype of the hardware? And or did your organization build a product that was on paper only? How do you get get a sense of the marketplace and the environment so that you know how to position yourselves? We had a question from the audience around how many RFP responses a proposal manager can support at one time? And the answer is it depends on a on the customer, the industry, the revenue, the duration of the procurement, and the complexity of the solution. Say the opportunity is a multi-billion dollar deal. It's the only RFP a proposal manager can handle. But oftentimes, in different environments, there might be uh, one or two additional proposal managers added to handle other elements of that opportunity. If the RFPs are smaller scale, and then depending on the timelines, a, a proposal might, manager might be able to handle one to three deals at the same time. It just all depends on, on that complexity and the, and the dollar values. Back to you, Brad. Excellent. Um, so let me try and summarize, um, Paul, because I, I know this is a new new topic for most of us on the webinar. So I'm going to go back to this here. So what we just went through, what, what Paul and Vicki just did for us is they took us in a little deeper dive into if my organization were going to be go through a, a business development assessment or appraisal we would be looking at we certainly want to look at our customer level of support at these five levels and see where we fit where do we fit when it comes to responding to customer opportunities rfps rfqs whatever form they come in uh, announcement of opportunity uh, and then we Paul and Vicki walked us through these are the things we would look for in that particular area and we would actually measure where do we fit are we in an ad hoc situation is that how we're operating are, are we operating in a level two maturity level so now uh, take a look then um, th this kind of reiterates what what Paul already said so we won't dwell on this but the concept is as we advance up each level in each category each process area we are likely to both improve win rate and capture ratio because of the discipline the rigor and the implementation and what I really like on this next visual is uh, and, and Paul, I'm going to ask you to just share this. What would a level three, since you've been kind of using that as, as maybe a goal state that a lot of companies want to get to, what does a level three organization look like in these areas? Sure. Well, we said we'd circle back um, and here we are, Brad. Um, level three certainly is a goal state for most clients. Um, some we find are already there, so they want to go to four and five, but majority are, are probably not quite there most of the time so let's just um circle back now so level three is the defined level so organizationally defined it means that the organization said this is how we do things here okay so it doesn't depend who the bid manager is or who the capture manager is this is how we do things here in this business um, now you can tailor that you can adjust it um, you can flex it to meet the needs of a particular opportunity. If it's a billion dollar deal, then there's a certain way of doing things. If it's a $50,000 task order, there's another way of doing things. Um, but there's a common framework. It's also a sharing and learning organization. People are willing to share. Um, the infrastructure is there to share information. Um, and uh, customer interactions, start early um, we don't wait for the response generation process area we we're working in in um, in solution collaboration early involvement with a customer or capture or account management or relationship building um, we're, we're getting ahead of the gaming a level three organization and importantly i'll ask vicky a question around this in a moment and we've we have touched upon this already um, but um, Level three organizations build competencies. 
they build competent people. They don't really enjoy everybody being a hero. So everybody being a hero, they burn out, they leave, they get fired, whatever. But organizational capability and competency stays. Uh, um, and, uh, and that is where organizations typically want to be rather than be in that chaotic state. Um, and, and so Vicky, on, on that question, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts, for example, and you did touch upon this a moment ago, actually, but maybe just to reiterate the thoughts about how recruitment and retention differs between a level three organization, the picture I'm painting here, and maybe that level one chaotic organization that we've been uh, describing as well. Yeah, and as, as Paul, Paul has described, the level three organizations have that discipline process in place and there's a great deal of clarity between roles and staff responsibilities. And along with this, a level three organization probably has a, a terrific external outreach program, uh, external marketing, and they also have a stellar reputation. They pay attention to reputation management. And, and these types of companies build up the competency competencies and skills of their staff and ultimately they attract the top talent and those staff typically stay or are promoted from within, move around to other business development roles in the company and add value to the organization. So this is a type of company that top talent want to work for. Thanks Vicki. Good, excellent. So um, again, one of the one of the pre-webinar questions was, could you give us an example of what uh, what an organization would look like um, within this uh, maturity model? So here here is a really good summary. So uh, you know, boiling this down, why did do, why does this matter? This matters if we are trying to organizationally improve. If we're trying to be more streamlined, more efficient, more uh, attractive to potential best talent, um, it takes work. Uh, it, it takes work to get there. Uh, otherwise, we just stay doing the same old, same old. And so to get to an advanced level of maturity in our organizations, um, th those those areas that, that Paul talked about in that model, remember the five by five? If we organizationally would, would be able to take a look at where we feel we're maybe the weakest and start chipping away and improving just a little bit in those areas, I think we would see uh, a huge difference in the way we compete. So we've talked about this idea of, of organizationally doing an appraisal. Where do we stand? Where do we stand? So what does that appraisal look like? Well, in, in brief, it looks, it, it takes on these areas. So Paul, would you just real quickly walk through what a notional BDCMM appraisal consists of? Sure. Um, so we run them as projects. They have a life cycle and most projects start with planning. So we start with planning and internal positioning. So why is the client wanting to do this? How is that gonna be briefed out to the team? What are they gonna expect us to be doing during the appraisal? And we're beginning to get a list of people that we need to speak to and engage with Brad from the very early stages. We then move into gathering the evidence. So this is um, an objective evidence-driven activity. Uh, so we're gathering data through for example, online surveys, we review proposals, various strategy and vision documentation, org charts, job analyses, looking at the key roles in the business. With that information, we then produce um, an early interim report. We bring together the initial evidence gathering and we say to the client, here's what we think we're finding here. Help us to tune this as we go forward into the appraisal. Um, so that's a major activity. Then with that um, interim findings agreed and the interview plan agreed, then go and speak to people. We go and speak to uh, all manner of um, people involved in business winning, either on a part-time or full-time basis, whether they're in a functional role, whether they're engineers who get asked to contribute to 
to, to bids. Um, we speak to them about what's really happening. And we also use this stage, Brad, to test the recommendations because we're interested in providing practical improvement recommendations. So during the interview phase, before we go into reporting, we do knock the edges off those recommendations and make sure they can be uh, delivered by the organization and conclude with a presentation, obviously, Brad, to uh, leadership teams and indeed wider audiences. Excellent, good. Uh, like you said, like, like most project uh, initiatives, you, you know, it's kind of a phased approach to make sure the right people are engaged and, and uh, all stakeholders um, included. So again, thank you all for joining. Um, Mallory, is there anything that, uh, I know we've answered some of the questions along the way here, so I don't know if there's anything lingering or remaining that, that you think we ought to address? Um, maybe just one question, because we have answered most of them. Um, so Brad, I'll pose this question to you and then you can you know, ask um, anyone else to um, expand on it, but how do we create this BDCMM process in a virtual environment? Because um, a lot of things are going virtual after 2020, so how, how can we better do that? Yeah, and, and I think Paul did address that somewhat, and and I think, and I'm, correct me, uh, Paul, if necessary, but most of this work, if, if, if um, Business Winning Institute is engaged in a an appraisal, um, almost all of that is done through virtual means and often now it is reported out virtually. So it's uh, it's not difficult to reach individuals or teams virtually given where we are as far as technology advances and, and that's the state we're in. Uh, Paul, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, Brad. And in fact, um, in the last couple of years, the majority of appraisal projects have been delivered entirely virtually. Um, and uh, the client organizations are ready for that. We're ready for that. And it's a very effective means of conducting the, the project. What we may do is have one or two initial contact points face to face. Um, but the whole thing can be delivered very effectively virtually. Great. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Vicki, uh, Paul, Mallory, uh, all of you who attended. Uh, just, I hope we've answered these questions about what is BDCMM, drill home, the concept. We can't really manage what we can't measure organizationally or individually. We've got to be able to have some kind of measurement and standard uh, a BDCMM appraisal does provide that unbiased look into how we're doing and how we can get better. And it is sustainable. It is sustainable if we uh, accept the workload and the findings and, and, uh, and ex uh, implement with excellence. So thank you for your questions. Uh, we invite you, our next upcoming webinars are these two topics, and you see the dates here, you can find those on our website uh, under resources and webinars. We're gonna, we've got another uh, organization, partner organization joining us on October 26th. I think this is a fascinating topic, uh, making your win-loss analysis work. Uh, so we've actually got a, 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 what I consider a very current um, platform that, that uh, you might be interested in. It's not going to be a pitch, but it's going to talk about how we make win-loss analysis work for us. And we've got some specialists joining us for that session in October. And then we're going to uh, talk about this whole idea of, hey, we're in the business to win. Uh, how do we do that better at, at selling our solutions? So those are the next two topics. And with that, we'll uh, let you get back to your day job. And thank you again for joining us. Um, Vicki, Paul, Mallory, and all of you, thanks and have a great rest of your day. Take care.